Welcome to the Unitarian Christian Alliance podcast, episode 29, 30 Years in the Wilderness, with guests Jay and Eileen Kunzman. I'm Mark Kane. I just have to lead off with this. Registration is open for the first UCA conference, October 15 through 17, in Millersville, Tennessee, north of Nashville. Find out more at the Unitarian Christian Alliance.org website. I hope to see you there. It's gatherings like this which can inspire us to try new things, challenge us, and most of all, encourage us with friendships. Unitarian Christians are those who believe the one God is the Father, not the Trinity, and Jesus is not that God, but rather the Messiah, or the Anointed One of God. The term Unitarian had a strong showing in the early 1800s, Unfortunately, however, it tagged along for the ride as many went in very fuzzy directions. The Unitarian Universalists, prevalent in the USA, have hung on to that moniker, but it really doesn't belong there. I think they should just be called Universalists. It's more accurate. We are not the Unitarian Universalists. No, our serious emphasis on Scripture distinguishes us pretty notably. And full disclosure, us Unitarian Christians, we are curious critters. Besides being willing to jeopardize relationships and fellowship for the sake of what we see in Scripture, we are also curious because of one of our special powers. We can talk about God and Jesus and talk about them like they are two different individuals, and you won't realize that we actually believe they are two different individuals. It's like a magic, deceptive power where we can say what we believe, and it sounds so much like Scripture, you don't realize it's heresy. Like, here's something we may say, Jesus prayed to God. If you're a Trinitarian, you might hear something like this, the second person of the Godhead having emptied himself of some of the special divine stuff and having now taken upon himself a human nature, prayed to the first person of the Godhead in treating him for favor or blessing because being in a human nature causes him to be, in some way, in a position where he must ask for things from God while mysteriously also being God. You may hear something like that when we say Jesus prayed to God. But you know what's so insidious, so devilishly devious? Here is what we actually meant. Jesus prayed to God. Yeah, it's, it's almost scary how we do that. As crazy as all this may seem, please understand that we are quite sincerely committed to the teachings we find in Scripture. People may disagree with our interpretation, but if that's you, I hope you may be curious enough to try to figure out why and maybe learn how we developed this magical power. Note, if you don't agree with us, and you do try to figure out what we're talking about, I don't want you to go in blind. That's not fair to you, and Jesus teaches we should count the cost. See episode one, The Perilous Trinity Deep Dive. I take a stab at laying out the dangers and the pitfalls of such an effort. I hope it helps. Today, another first. A married couple, both of whom are classified in the genus Christianus, and the species Unitarianus. Thankfully, this biological classification does not describe an endangered species. There are many, many around the world. In this case, from the state of Wisconsin. So, Jay and Eileen, you are the first couple that I have interviewed for the podcast. Congratulations. I think I could send you a trophy for that. You have my address. (laughs) (laughs) All right, well... So why don't we back up and hear a little bit about each of you, kind of how you ended up becoming a Unitarian Christian couple. So I was saved at a Pentecostal church when I was about 18 or 19. Um, The UPC church, the pastor from the church came into the restaurant where I worked and started talking with me, introduced me to a friend of his, and he started going there. And then Jay came to the church one Sunday with a friend, Mm. and that's how we met. And I guess we pretty much hit it off right away, right, Jay? I guess. 
Was that your first time to a church too, Jay? No, because I I got saved in college prior to that. Okay. Uh, with a with a, a college roommate, ah, who who gave me a pamphlet, Power for Living. Ah. I think it was by Billy Graham. So as soon as I read that, that I'm like, oh, this answers all my questions about life. <laughs> ah. <laughs> so then I went to a Baptist church up there. That was probably the first church I went to in college. Yes. I see. And then how did you end up going in the doors at the, at the UPC church where Eileen was? Well, I, I graduated from college and came back home. So that UPC church was just a few minutes from my house. I don't think we've actually mentioned where home is for you guys. <laughs> a- Appleton, Wisconsin. Okay. I mean, this was a church I was saved at, so whatever they taught me is what I pretty much believed. But then when I met Jay... Hmm. He started studying out some of the things, and we didn't agree with everything. And when he brought it to me, I know God was just working because then it made whatever his objections were, I understood and I agreed. Okay. The UPC church, as we all know, I mean, tongues is a big thing. Mm -hmm. It was that fact alone, I think, only because I started seeing how they tried to get people to speak in tongues. Mm. Oh, this isn't something that just happens. This is something that it looks like they, they try to get you to do. Oh, okay. So I think that sent me on a little treasure hunt mm. to try to figure out, you know, what does the Bible really say about tongues? Yeah, I think it was mostly that. And I, I mean, I had been at that church for three years and never really felt comfortable with that. Kind of just went along with it because otherwise you're not accepted there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, there was a lot of good things about it there. And I, I had a lot of close friends. And yeah. for some reason, I was very amenable to leaving because I, I saw where Jay was coming from. When we were out from the church, then we went to visit Jay's college friend, Mm. and he said, I believe in oneness too, but a little bit different than the UPC does. Ah. And he gave us that pamphlet, Who is Jesus by Anthony Buzzard. And it pretty much clicked, you know, (laughs) immediately. Ah. You know, here's the thing, though. I mean, I knew what oneness was, Mm -hmm. and I would say I probably knew oneness more than Trinitarianism, but I, I don't think I was ever a staunch Trinitarian, I would say that that's probably why that message in the pamphlet from Anthony resonated so quickly. Yeah. I hadn't had those Trinitarian dogmas cemented in my mind. Mm. If you've never studied it and you don't really know, understand how the doctrine was formulated, yeah. I, I think it would be an easy, oh, that makes a lot of sense then. Mm-hmm. And that explains a lot of what you see in some survey results that show a lot of people when asked questions sound like they're not Trinitarian when they're trying to explain what they believe. You know, if they don't have a, a heavy teaching that takes place where they're given the formulas, the language, they kind of default to, you know, stuff that just sounds like the Bible. Right. So, Jay, when you found that pamphlet and it clicked for you, what did Eileen think of that? I don't recall there was any like, yeah, what about this? What about that? No. We didn't get into it, any. It, it was just like, this makes sense. Let's move on forward. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I think God had a pretty good plan to make us, you know, one on that issue. Yeah. Well, being unified in that is such a blessing. Mm-hmm. Well, if we could back up, mm-hmm. I, I don't think we mentioned this, Eileen. You, oh, yeah. I know what you're going to say. <laughs> you told me that I'm never going to leave this church. Oh, the Oneness Church. Right. Mm-hmm. With that in mind, I was deathly afraid of telling her anything that might disrupt that feeling. Oh. The Unitarian doctrine was one thing. I mean, that came later, but it was these other things that I was questioning. That's interesting. So Eileen says she doesn't want to ever leave the church, and yet you're questioning things, Jay. That had to create some conflict. You lost sleep, you said. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was terrible because I was studying tongues intensely. Yeah. And also, we were married only like six months at this point. <laughs> okay. And we had only dated for... I don't know, five or six months. So we, oh. we just knew each other like less than a year, I think. So this could have been disastrous. <laughs> oh, no. Well, I think she knew that it wasn't just something I, oh, I just found this verse. I think you're wrong. <laughs> hmm. I think because I was never real comfortable with that aspect of the church to begin with, it was easy to accept that we didn't believe in it. I see. The way that UPC does. Yeah. Okay. So you didn't know that she was uncomfortable with it until you finally started talking about it? Probably not, because I didn't probably want to admit that I didn't like that. (laughs) (laughs) Isn't that delightful how uh, organizations make you do group think? Mm -hmm. Well, that's Trinitarianism all the way. 
unfortunately. Yeah. And I was 22 years old too. So, I, you know, I maybe would be able to speak my mind a little bit more now than back then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was, I mean, so you look at the average person who's into the group think, mm -hmm. they don't want to be outside of that. Yeah. But I often wonder how many of the leaders feel the way mm -hmm. the people do. Mm -hmm. And they're just as afraid to come out of that for fear of losing your church or, you know, what are the other leaders going to say about me, especially if you're a leader in the evangelical movement, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's that's where things get really dicey. In some groups, there's just no freedom to question, at least without fear of retribution. Mm -hmm. Well, let's roll forward to after you found the pamphlet, it clicked for both of you, and now you're a couple in Wisconsin without a church. No, we tried all kinds of different churches. We tried a Baptist church. It was a small startup Baptist church. We went there for a little while, and I don't know, the pastor really wanted us to do more than we felt comfortable with, I think. I think that's why we left there. Do more, like be involved more? Yeah. He wanted us to buy them a house as a, like a parsonage. Not us personally, but... As a church, but there was like, well, geez, we're awfully small to be making such a commitment like that. Oh, interesting. Um, we tried big churches, small churches, um, Lutheran church. Did you ever find a, a church that had a Unitarian doctrine? We did. Uh, yes. <laughs> we did, locally. <laughs> it's a little uncomfortable telling this story just because it sounds bad. Maybe that there is one church in our area that is Unitarian, but we don't go there. We did go there, but we don't go there. Doesn't sound like you, la it, you lasted very long there. Um, well, three and a half years. There, there, there are some issues with leadership. The pastor was Pentecostal, oneness doctrine, and became a Unitarian on his own through his own study. Oh. I think because he still had a lot of the Pentecostal mindset. Hmm. If you didn't, um, I don't know, I felt like I could never really totally be myself. Like, is this good enough? Or... Hmm. Is this not Christian enough? Yeah, that reminds me of uh, what they call like the holiness movement, where like there seems to be a very controlling culture within a church. People mm -hmm. dress a certain way, yep. talk a certain way, and you feel a lot of pressure to to be a part of that. And they were coming out of that. It, it was better, ah. but there was a lot of it still there. And not that we had to be right in everything, but our point of view was never going to be right. It was always going to be their way or the highway. Mm. It was not a good fit. Yeah, that's tough. So that didn't work out. What you tried a few others, I suppose. I uh, yeah, we 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 found this couple through a home homeschool convention who had a home church, and it was um, I don't know forty five minutes away from our house. It was a little long, but we're like, okay, let's try it. So we ended up going there, I don't know, quite a few times. Hmm. And then um, we had dinner with them one time. This couple brought it up about having questions about the Trinity, and Jay and I are kicking each other under the table. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. they seemed really open. Like, oh, yeah, we, you know, we've, we've questioned that over the years ourselves. Wow. But shortly after that, they wanted to have dinner with me, him and three other guys. Mm. Went to dinner, and they thought they were going to, you know, set me straight. Oh. And, of course, I laid out scriptures, and I'm like, no, this isn't, this, this is not right, this is not right. So when they came to the house and asked you to go to dinner, did, did you know it was for that purpose, or did you think they were just being... No, I think I did. I, I knew what the motive was. Yeah. Okay. I mean, why else would <laughs> three other guys want to have dinner with you right after this? <laughs> yeah. Probably what happened is they went to the other couple, and the other couple said, oh, wait a minute, that's a heresy, that, that's a cult, uh -huh. you better watch it, we better get rid of these people. I see. Well, not get rid of them, but, you know, <laughs> we better meet with him and, and, and... We need to set them straight or they can't come to our fellowship. Because it was a small home fellowship, mm -hmm. like about four or five families. Okay. So, yeah, that didn't work out either. You're, you're not batting 100 yet, guys. No. no. <laughs> then we tried a church that was another small startup church. Had a nice talk with the pastor and his wife after the service. And I, we must have brought it up, our beliefs. They seemed very receptive. They were very kind, and we thought, oh, maybe this will work out. Hmm. And then the next day, get a knock on the door, and it's the postal worker with a certified letter from them telling us not to come back. <laughs> 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 so, 
a certified letter. Yeah, they couldn't just make a phone call or anything. They had to make sure that we got the letter so that we would not darken the doors of their church ever again. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that is that is crazy. That was crazy. <laughs> Did you save this letter? That seems like that should go in the Unitarian Museum. I know. I should have. I don't know. I must not have. I was wondering about that, too. Oh. That would be good. Yeah. Unitarian <laughs> Museum, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah. Unitarian Christian Museum. We'll have it as like a, an extra branch off the UCA. We'll, we'll set up a <laughs> location. and That's crazy. Yeah. I'm... I'm and we still even tried other churches after that experience. <laughs> you haven't learned your lesson, apparently. No. There's got to be somebody that, that'll accept us. <laughs> we, okay, so just take me to that moment when you got that letter. I, you know, I just I want to live that moment when you get this letter. Yeah, I think Jay was probably at work. Mm. I know I was mad because I was like, I can't believe they couldn't just have the courtesy of a phone call saying, hey, you know, it's really not what we believe and we you know, we'd rather you didn't come and spread that message or whatever. Okay, we can respect that, but... Yeah. So what, what did you think about it, Jay, when you, when you got home from work? Or did she call you at work to tell you? <laughs> oh, I'm sure she did. I'm sure she did, yeah. I, I was just, you know, I was shocked as Eileen was probably when she got the letter. <laughs> what is this? Oh, oh. <laughs> something important. <laughs> Somebody cares about us enough to send us a certified letter. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> Oh, that has got to be one of the more <laughs> unique rejections I have heard yet. That's, oh, uh, well, you got to make it official. <laughs> that's true. You, you don't want there to be any misunderstanding. No. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. Like, how many years would you say you tried and tried and tried? You left the UPC, you became Unitarian Christians, and then you tried things. How many years are we talking before we get to now? I'd say 30. 30 ish, you know. Yeah. You're not the only couple that just feels like you're kind of drifting along, never really fitting in. So you had a few experiences in the last few years that set you up in a new direction. Let's talk through that. Yeah, so we, we found out about the Converge. Mm -hmm. So we, we went and met great people. We met a couple from a church in Illinois, which was about three hours south of us. Oh, yeah. Met them at a table. They were one of the first couples we sat down and chatted with and we hit it off really well with them. They've come up to our house several times already ah. to be part of our fellowship. Wait, so at Converge, you sit down at a table with somebody who's probably as close as anybody could be to you, potentially. I mean, three hours away is not bad. No, no. no. Wow, good, good luck there. When we first got there, we're standing in line for the very first meal, and there's people behind us talking and people in front of us talking, and we kind of feel like we're it's just us. And we're like, wait a minute. <laughs> mm. We're going to meet people here. We're not just going to be yeah. just us. So then... From the first meal, we decided we were going to put ourselves out there and talk to different people, which we did. And we ended up meeting lots of people. That's cool. So we had lunch the last day with Jerry Weirwill and his then fiance. Mm -hmm. Talked about a lot of our church history, and he encouraged us to start a home fellowship, no matter how small, no matter if we didn't know what we were doing, just try to get something going. Okay. That was very encouraging. We just decided, okay, we're going to do it. So my <laughs> sister is also Unitarian. Mm. She was a Christian after me, but then when I told her about our, the Unitarian belief, it made sense to her too. So okay. we know her and then another friend from the Unitarian church that didn't work out. Mm. She had also left. We were not the only people that left, so we asked mm. her if she would be interested. And she jumped on that. So it's been... Uh. Jay and I and our 15-year-old daughter and the friend and my sister, Ginny. Okay. And so how soon after Converge did you get together the first time? Three months. So you got right on that. That's mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. So we've been meeting for a year and a half, every other week, pretty much. All right. So w had you not thought about that before Converge? We did, but I think part of it was, I'm not a pastor. I don't want to lead. Mm. I mean, I could, I, you know, if, if I really, really felt God calling me. Still, I, I don't mind leading a study or whatever, but yeah. to actually be the leader of a group, uh, you know. And that's one thing that Jerry did encourage us. It doesn't matter if you're not pastor kind of people. Just do something. Yeah. Yeah. We've come to expect churches to be structured in a particular way. There's a main leader, somebody who's pastoring, and then there's teachers. You know, you've got this whole framework. 
But a home fellowship can break all of those norms entirely. Your example could help others who think, well, how could we have a group if we don't have a pastor? Why don't you explain how can you have a group (laughs) if you don't have a pastor? Everybody comes with needs. It's just meeting needs. Hmm. So a pastor, that's his job is to care for his flock, right? Yeah. But if everybody comes and everybody shares what's on their mind, now it can be a need as simple as, hey, I can't make my rent this month. Can, can everybody help? Yeah, everybody throws in, you know, whatever, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's caring for the body, right? You don't need a pastor to tell you that somebody can't make the rent, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right? But, I mean, you do need a pastor and a teacher to expound on some of the deeper things of God and, and that sort of thing, mm-hmm. and not everybody has that gift. But if you're in a group and everybody's open to God and God can speak to each one to meet the needs of the people, I mean, that, that's really where it's at. Also, it's 2021, so we have all kinds of technology available. (laughs) We've watched sermons. A couple of the people that gave messages at Converge, we looked them up and watched some of their sermons. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we'll just talk the whole time. Sometimes it is good to, you know, because if you have one pastor, you'll get his take on things. Right. But if you go and say, hey, let's watch a video on this guy, but then over here, this guy's got a little different take on it. Mm. Let's see what we can learn from each of them and not be stuck on one man's interpretation. Mm. And then we have time to talk about it. In a structured type of church, you hear the message, you fellowship a little after and go home, and it doesn't have to be that way, but it tends to be that way sometimes. Oh, yeah. We're this, we're just in our living room. So we watch the sermon and then we can talk about it. I've seen some churches where they do that on purpose. They actually have a fellowship time that follows Mm. the sermon. That's a good idea. With the expressed intent that as you're sitting around the table, you would have some talking points, some some things to consider as a small group. It's a way to engage Mm -hmm. the people in the church with the message more deeply, because now you're talking about it instead of just Mm -hmm. shaking hands and saying, it was good to Mm -hmm. see you, and leaving. Right. So without a formal structure, You guys have tried and done lots of different things in your fellowships. I like it. I mean, I probably, I I don't know how I'd feel about, or I don't know what you want to call a regular church. (laughs) I kind of like this setup. I'd like our fellowship to grow. We'd love to have more people. Yeah. Um, But I like, I like the way we do it. Hmm. I do too, and don't get me wrong, but there's still a part of me that likes an established church Mm -hmm. that has all the order and it's more predictable. (laughs) Yeah. We all like to be predictable, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I think I, I would like a balance between the two. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's that, that would be a good compromise. Yeah. So, Mark, did we ever tell you about the group we met now from Green Bay? I don't think you did. This is a good plug for the UCA. Okay. <laughs> Another thing that just happened recently in the last two months was I was on the UCA website looking at the map again, and there was... I think three dots in our area Ah. on the map. So I clicked on the one that was us, and then I clicked on another one, and it was in Green Bay, which is a half an hour north of us. Ah. And so I emailed the contact person and told her about us, and she told me about them. They were all at the same UPC church, and they all left there together and formed their own home fellowship. They all came to the Unitarian Belief on their own then after leaving the UPC. Wow. They came to our house early June, and we met together, and we have plans to, at least once a month, if not more, get our two groups together. (laughs) That's fantastic. Yeah. And just because of summer, everybody's schedules, we haven't seen them since that first week in June, but probably in August we'll be seeing them again. And they are fantastic. Oh, well, see, that's the way it's supposed to work. I love it. Because every other time I've checked, there's a group in Hudson, Wisconsin, I think probably three or four hours from here, and there might Mm. be one down farther south, but there's never been anything that close. I'm like, wait, there's somebody in Green Bay now. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, and they're great. They're great people. I think we meshed really well, so they're happy to come our way sometimes, and we'll go their way sometimes. Very nice. So they just recently showed up on the UCA map then, because you would... Yes, because I check there periodically. Right. Just like through the 30 years of wandering in the desert, I've <laughs> checked the phone book periodically the on the internet or whatever um, to see maybe there's a new church out there that we could try. Yeah, yeah. So. That is so exciting. That warms my heart. 
One of them is an older gentleman that lives in a assisted living. He wore a suit. He was a hoot. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. I'm I'm so excited to see that within the last several years, from the encouragement you got at Converge to just start your own group, pastor or no pastor, just if you get together, you can you know watch YouTube together, watch sermons together, talk about it. The key, I think, is just get together and don't sit in isolation mm -hmm. waiting for something to happen. Right. It's not, it's not difficult. You know, you're meeting with other Christians. So if everybody's not out to, you know, have an ax to grind, you know, everybody's out to, to meet each other's needs, you're, you're going to, you should do well. Yeah. It just seems too simple. Like, mm -hmm. how could that possibly work? Jim? <laughs> right. <laughs> It'll be fun to check in in a few years and see where things have gone. Maybe at some point I will actually meet somebody from the Green Bay group, and they can talk about their side of that exact same exchange when they got an email from Eileen. Right. It works, because they, yeah. they would have just signed up and within not very long have gotten this email. Right. That's, that's a nice turnaround. That's, mm -hmm. that's pretty quick. Mm -hmm. Let me think here. We've been talking 56 minutes, and obviously I will edit a lot of it. It'll never be this long. You know, I think that'll work. It'll, it'll be interesting. I think you have a lot of editing to do. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I appreciate your willingness to do it. You were like, sure. I, I, I just love that. People who are kind of living on the edge like that. <laughs> oh, yeah. We live on the edge, mm -hmm, don't we, Jay? Yeah, right. <laughs> you, you crazy <laughs> kids, you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Connecting with others dramatically changed the direction for Jay and Eileen, and now they can bless others in kind, even with a small group. Size is of no concern when we're dealing with the plans of he who created the cosmos. A while back, I have jokingly asked for Unitarian knock-knock jokes. That invitation still stands, and if you do record yourself saying one, either with a record link in the notes or just sending me the audio file in an email, I will make it sound good. You'll see. But I've had no jokes yet. So here's something different. What would you like to see in the Unitarian Christian Museum? from any era or place, something you could imagine sitting in a protective glass case with a plaque under it. I, I think your answers to this may be rather interesting and funny. It's hard to know. I don't think anyone has ever propositioned a podcast audience for items to place in an imaginary Unitarian Christian museum. We are breaking all the norms here, boldly going where no podcast has gone before. Obviously, we'd want that letter that Eileen and Jay got by certified mail. That's nearly priceless. Let me start this off with my own entry. I'd place in the museum the first print of Tyndale's translation. The plaque would read, In the late 1400s, Tyndale translated Hutos in John 1, not as he, but as it, thereby disqualifying his translation from serious use by Trinitarian apologists for centuries to come. This very copy, he was on the desk with Tyndale. If you could think of something you'd put in the museum, drop me some audio. Even if I just get a few, I'll try to feature them in some future podcast. Hi, Mark. Here's Philippus from Germany. I'm really grateful for your podcast because it makes it feel like we are part of a bigger family and there are other people around and it feels like being home. So thank you very much. Thanks, Philippus. You shared a few other things, but I cut those out. I'm going to save all of that for a future interview, and I look forward to it. Piling even more into this episode, a cornucopia of bounty, let's check in with Brandon Duke on a UCA video that came out about four months ago. It's called The Trouble with the Trinity. So what are your thoughts on it? I'm really, really happy with that one. I hope that that one gets played far and wide because it was an attempt to take about a 35,000 word article of Dr. Dale Tuggies in the Stanford Encyclopedia of, of Philosophy and turned it into a three minute, <laughs> 300 and something word summary. Yeah. I just think it's really important for people to kind of get the big picture of what he's at. Yeah. Where he, he puts Trinitarians on the horns of this dilemma where on one hand, if they see God as one self, as like the Latin tradition does, that it collapses the father and son in, into one self, and that's ridiculous from a biblical standpoint. Mm -hmm. And if they're a three-self Trinitarian, sort of the, the social Trinitarian view, that that's almost inevitably tritheism. 
there's really no way out of that. And then if they choose not to give us an explication of what they really are saying, then then it's just mystery. They, they haven't really said anything at all, not enough mm-hmm. for something to believe. And so it's just a devastating, I think, rational approach to comparing Trinitarian theories of all their various types against the Bible and showing how they just don't work. Yeah. Well, I'm sure the rational approach is actually one of the critiques, like, well, you're all being very <laughs> rational about this. Stop it. Right, right, because we wouldn't want to be rational in our reading of the Bible or in our relationship to God or in the things that we hold most dear and that base our entire lives off of. That would be, <laughs> that would be really dangerous. We'd, we'd prefer irrationality. <laughs> well, that's how you know it's spiritual. Right, <laughs> certainly. You know, as a side note, there is actually a recent Trinities podcast that people could go look at where Dr. Tuggy interviews a theologian and a philosopher from Notre Dame who explicitly says, yes, The Chalcedonian Creed of of two natures is contradictory, has logical contradictions in it, and we should accept them as such. We should accept true contradictions. And to anybody out there that just hit their head on their steering wheel (laughs) or slapped themselves upside the head, that is the correct response to someone that tells you to accept true contradictions. Um, But it shows the extent that Trinitarians are both desperate to, to cope with the problem that Dr. Tuggy is pressing. It also shows the length at which Trinitarians will go to accept each other's views, where each of these three vastly different views, one self, you know, Latin views, three self social Trinitarian views, four self views, where there are three selves in the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Spirit, and the Trinity itself, are all being put forward by Trinitarians to try to resolve these problems. And you know, they tend to see it as an embarrassment of riches, whereas the rest of us could look at it and say, no, it's just an embarrassment. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is really wrong. There should be one coherent explanation for this. And um, again, referring to the Trinity's podcast, there's a great episode or one of my favorite episodes of it <laughs> where Dr. Tuggy does this, this uh, it's called the Trinity Club, I believe. And he, he yeah. does this send up of what you get when you sign up to be a member of the Trinity Club and get your membership card and all the rules that you have to follow, which are really just two. And then you can say whatever you want about God and Jesus. And as long as you show your Trinity card, you can say God is four selves or that logical contradictions are true and get away with it. Yeah, that was a great episode. I'm not surprised you referenced Dale Tuggy episodes based on our interview several episodes ago. <laughs> you binged them all. <laughs> yeah, I uh, yeah, I might be the uh, what's the what's the term? Uh, I, I might be the official like librarian archivist for the Trinity's <laughs> podcast. I'd like to say I'm the ultimate fanboy, but I think there's been people out there that could probably they could probably outmatch me on Trinity's <laughs> trivia. So um, I will stay humble and just say that I enjoy them. But yeah, but yeah this video, hopefully for somebody that's not <laughs> binge listened to 300 and something uh, Trinity's podcast could in three minutes introduce them to the idea and maybe equip them to then talk to their Trinitarian friends and say, well, well, which Trinitarian view do you, do you hold to? Is it, do you really think of God more as three cells or, or more as one self? And then you can press them and say, well, if one self how can the father and son be one self praying to itself? And if you're a, if you're more of a three self Trinitarian where you think they're all three, you know, independent selves and they're all fully divine, then then how is that not three gods? Mm-hmm. You know, is it just that they're working together that, you know, Mark and I working together doesn't make us one person, no matter how closely we like to work together. Um, <laughs> thank goodness for both of us, mostly for Mark. Um, but yeah, I hope that it'll help sort of prepare people for that. And, and be something they could share with their Trinitarian friends to kind of crack open the door. And yeah, we may be uh, accused of being rationalists, but I think maybe I'm willing to accept that moniker. <laughs> yeah. I guess the opposite would be be an irrationalist. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't know. That doesn't sound particularly better. No, but. no, I, I understand. <laughs> I mean, we don't want to sound arrogant like we know everything that we can know about God, but that's not what we're claiming at all. I mean, all we're saying is that these varied and diverse trinity theories they lack humility they lack the humility to say boy we've we've read our bibles in a way that forces us to to deal with all these strange contradictions and problems and uh as a unitarian you can read your bible and say no jesus is a man empowered by god that works you can just use straight biblical phraseology you don't have to you know be a philosophy professor with 160 iq in order to be able to 
to express it. So. Remember in that recent episode with Mary McCarty where she noted that when she was teaching the Sunday school class and she just said what she believed as a Unitarian, nobody had any questions. They're just, <laughs> that just worked for them. Yeah. They're like, well, yeah, uh-huh, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense that when you misread something, whether that's you know reading a book, like a fiction book or a history or something, or watch a movie, and when you miss watch it, you misunderstand it and talk to your friends about it, uh, you've got to come up with a convoluted explanation to try now and make it coherent, to make it work. Yeah, yeah. And if we get it right, then things just fit together and we all saw the same thing. And I'm sure the philosophers of science would have something to say about this when you have a theory that requires all of these ad hoc or extra levels of complication to try to smooth out the edges usually means we're not at the base science, the, the fundamental theory. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, it's been that way in physics and in other science, you know, chemistry and biology. We run into that all the time where we have this convoluted way of explaining the orbit of the planets or something. And it works and you can, you can do it if you can do the math. But then when you get the actual true theory, all of a sudden it gets very simple. Mm. Yeah, complexity is, a, is it should be a worrisome sign. It doesn't always mean that your theory is wrong. But yeah, the burden of proof should be on the side of Okay, if that's your theory and it is this complex and has required how many millions of pages of theologians right. to try to explain it, and they still say, hey, we, we need to get this right. Yeah, and still disagree with each other. And still disagree. If that's one side of the argument, I think the burden of proof really is on that side. Uh, by the way, I, I'm sure you've enjoyed, when you were a child, the Huckleberry Finn story. Mm -hmm. um, Tom Sawyer, in that story, he's actually an alien from Mars. I don't know if you knew this. <laughs> right. But... <laughs> It's really quite simple. You just have to understand he had his human nature that is the one you see most of the time in the story, but he also had his alien nature. And you, ah. there's, uh, and I, is the raft that they used really a metaphor for the spaceship that he's using to travel from one locale to another? Wow, you and, have the spirit already. I'm, I'm sensing it. <laughs> that, that came on fast. Yeah. But, it, you know, that's kind of what, it's like an example of that. Yeah. And you're like, well, here's actually the, the underlying part of the story that doesn't really get a lot of airplay. But if you look closely, like when his friend says, man, Tom, you're out of this world. That was actually an admission <laughs> that Tom Sawyer was an alien. Of his true nature. And right. yeah, and the reason that they didn't go into it was because his friend already knew he was an alien. Right. And the whole audience would have read that exactly that way too. Exactly. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Mark Twain knew his audience, you know, in middle America in the 1800s would absolutely read in alien technology into that story and so he didn't have to be explicit he could just say you're out of this world yeah yeah, yeah. i wonder if that phrase is actually in there probably not but that's a good <laughs> 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 it's a great episode it was from several episodes back so you have to just scroll down through the list of the episodes in the channel the trouble with the trinity yeah uh, if you hadn't seen it yet i do recommend you seeing it thanks mark if you've got feedback Email podcast at unitarianchristianalliance.org. Even more funner, m most fun, no, m most more funnerist, use your voice with the record link in the show notes or on the podcast page, podcast.unitarianchristianalliance.org. Jay and Eileen, thanks for taking time to visit with me. Oh, and tell your new UCA friends hello from me. May God bless you in your truth pursuits. I hope this podcast serves you well. He wore a suit. He was a hoot. <laughs>